Chapter 5 Matthias Fullman sat in a claw-footed chair and watched as the light slowly illuminated the sleeping woman. He felt a tinge of envy, watching Silja sleep. It had been a long time since he had slept so soundly. There were too many black deeds and fell memories to allow him the sleep of the just. Of late, the problem was made only worse by his feelings for Silja. The nightmares he suffered were not only the horrors of the past, but fears of the future. If he closed his eyes too long, he could see Anya's face. Not the way it had looked when he had wed her, but the way it had looked on that last ghastly night in Beshafen. Reason told him it was impossible for the same thing to happen to Silja, but reason did not keep the dread from filling his heart or tormenting his mind. The great witch hunter, Matthias thought. The man of iron whose courage never wavered, whose resolve is as unshakable as the great cathedral of Sigmar. Only he wasn't. He knew the fear of old night and the uncertainty of pity and mercy. He knew the despair of loneliness and the desperate longing for someone to fill the emptiness of his heart. He'd been unequal to the labor of holding his selfish desire in check, too weak to deny himself the solace and warmth that Silja was offering. Thulman felt guilt well up inside him. He should have never accepted Silja's love. He couldn't claim her, couldn't do justice by her. All he could do was bring her more pain, and she had already had enough of that in her life. Maybe far worse than pain, he thought, considering the task he'd intended to accomplish before the day's end. Anya had been destroyed for loving him. He had no right to allow Silja to risk the same. He would tell her as much, and force her to understand that their night had simply been a pleasant happenstance and nothing more. It couldn't be allowed to be more. Fulman nearly jumped out of the chair as a fist pounded against the chamber door. He saw Silja stir uneasily in the bed, as the sound reverberated throughout the room. The witch hunter leapt to his feet and hurried to the door before the summons could be repeated. About time you are moving your arse, Matthias. Strang's grimy countenance filled the doorway. The mercenary carried a pair of heavy leather coats over his arm. You still have a mind to go? he asked. Then his gaze settled on the bed and the body smile spread across his bearded face. Of course, if you are too tired, we could always go tomorrow. Fulman snatched one of the coats from the henchman. Damn your tongue, he snapped joining the mercenary in the hallway and closing the door behind him. Is everything ready? Just the way you wanted it, Strang said. I hired a pair of horses for us from a stable close to the south gate of the city. If anybody's waiting for us to take our own mounts, they're going to be disappointed. As they should be, Fulman said. I'll have none of Zerndorf's dogs meddling in my affairs. With the uncertain political climate in the Temple of Sigmar and the upper echelons of its witch hunters, Fulman knew there would be spies and informants abroad, more than usual even. Each one eager to find some morsel of information that their masters could use for their own ends. The change in horses, the early hour, and the crude clothing both men had adopted by way of disguises should cause at least enough confusion to set them free of Aldorf without any interference. When they reached the street, Fulman cast one final look at the black tusk and the window at his room. He thought again of Silja Markov and how peacefully she slept. Then he thought of the monster he was going to see, the monster who robbed him of so much in the past, and who stole from him whatever happiness he might have claimed with Silja. Fiery twilight smoldered on the horizon before their destination rose up before them. They had followed a cautious, circuitous route, leaving by Aldorf's most southerly gate and riding a winding path that turned in upon itself several times, circling their way past the many small towns and villages scattered beyond the city walls. The witch hunters showed extreme care while they traveled, constantly watching for any sign that they were being followed. Their destination was an island, a jagged fang of rock rising from the middle of the river Reich. The rough grey rocks were capped by an immense structure, its fang-like towers apparently stabbing vindictively at a starlit sky. A palpable atmosphere of suffering and misery drifted down to them from the island fortress as they drew near. 
The ferryman was not hard to find in the encroaching gloom, the light from his house the only sign of life along the desolate shore. A scrawny boy led their horses into a large stable building, while the ferryman lit a lantern and led away to the large flat-bottomed skiff. Thulman hesitated as he saw the boat, and his hand unconsciously closed around a small hammer icon hanging from his neck, the holy symbol of Sigmar. The river was shallow along a narrow expanse, stretching from the shore to the rocky island. The ferryman propelled his skiff through the water with a long pole, pushing them ever closer to their goal. The feeling of misery grew as the craggy grey rocks and crushing architecture of the fortress drew nearer. Strang blanched as the grim influence washed over him, retrieving a small flask from his boot and taking a liberal pull on its contents. A small wood jetty projected from the base of the rocky cliff, a long winding stair snaking its way towards the fortress perched on the island summit. Two soldiers watched them with keen interest as they drew near. Strang recognized the funnel mouth contraption one of the pair held as a blunderbuss, a murderous weapon infamous for the ability to butcher multiple opponents with a single shot. The man trained his weapon on them, his face as expressionless as a stone mask. I have business with the Castellan, Fulman told the soldiers as the skiff came to rest beside the jetty. The two guards remained silent, studying the coarse, oxide coat and scruffy clothing Fulman had adopted. Tell him Herr Grubel is here, he added. It was an old alias. He didn't want anyone knowing of his visits to the Reichsfang. The soldier without the blunderbuss turned, stalking into the small shack nestled between the jetty and the stairs. One moment later he reappeared, a slip of parchment in his fingers. He placed it in a small clay jar, its rim attached to a slender rope that rose up into the darkness. The soldier glanced up at Fulman and then struck a large brass bell. The jar began to rise as the rope was pulled up. Long minutes passed. The guards remained immobile, the blunderbuss still fixed in the direction of the skiff. The ferryman sat at the far end of the little boat, ready to drop into the river if the soldier started to fire. Fulman closed his eyes and thought about what he had come here to do. Maybe the Castellan would not admit him. Maybe the man he had come to see was finally dead. The witch hunter dismissed both possibilities, refusing to deceive himself with any desperate and foundless hope. The Castellan would admit him. Fulman knew too much about a man for him to do anything else. The prisoner would also still be here, alive, because Moore wouldn't admit such scum into his realm. Finally, the clay jar reappeared, dropping out of the darkness as if by magic. The guard withdrew a slip of parchment from the vessel. He read it a moment and then nodded to his companion. Streng gaped in relief as he saw the soldier turn the blunderbuss away. Herr Grubel, the first guard was saying as Fulman stepped up onto the jetty. Welcome to Reichsfang Prison. The sprawling bulk of the fortress loomed above their heads as Fulman and Streng made their way deeper into the heart of the Reichsfang. Streng had drained the flask of schnapps, yet still couldn't keep his hairs on the back of his neck from crawling. The Reichsfang was maybe the most infamous structure in Reichland, if not the entire empire. Once consigned to the black depths of the Reichsfang, few would ever see the light of sun again. Disease, malnourishment and despair were the great killers of this prison, running rampant through its close, confined labyrinth of holes. With the onset of winter, hundreds of the miserable wretches would perish from the frosty chill that would sink into the cramped, lightless cells. The Castellan's meeting with Fulman was brief. The aged officer was quick to hand over a set of keys to the unwelcome visitor, and then hurried back to the upper reaches of the Reichsfang central tower. One of the keys served to unlock a heavy iron-bound door, exposing a narrow stairway that wound its way deep into the bedrock. With only a small torch to light their way, the two men had descended. The eerie silence of their passage was broken only by the occasional muffled moan, reaching to them through the stone from the network of cells and dungeons just beyond the walls of the stairwell. In years past, the lord and master of the Reichsfang had been the notorious Judge Volkberg, a power-mad magistrate who had terrorized the Reichland for decades with sadistic and brutal brands of justice. 
Volkberg had ordered special dungeons excavated far beneath the main prison, so deep within the roots of the rock that they were below even the water level. It was here that Volkberg confined his worst prisoners, those who had in some way earned his personal enmity. Down, ever down, the stairs wound, until at last the chill of the river began to turn their breath to frost. Strang stifled a sneeze with the sleeve of his tunic. The stair twisted around one final corner and stopped before a massive steel door. Fulman hesitated a moment, and then fumbled among the keys the castellan had given him before selecting the one that would open the portal. Beyond was a long corridor, stretching away into the gloom beneath the Reichsfang. Heavy steel doors were interspersed along the stone walls of the passage. A few torches sputtered and crackled in sconces set into the walls, their light illuminating the condensation seeping in the walls and dripping from the roof. Strang tried to stifle another sneeze and failed, and the sound of his affliction rolled down the silent corridor like thunder. Fulman cast an annoyed look at his companion and then returned his attention to the passageway. One of the steel doors creaked open, slapping against the wall with a metallic ring. An immense hand gripped the edge of the door frame. A gigantic arm followed it, and then a huge bulk pushed its way through the opening, bent and nearly double to fit through the doorway. Strang fingered his sword nervously, and then realized that the weapon would be as much use as a letter opener when the creature emerged fully into the corridor, and straightened to its full height. It had been many years, and he'd forgotten the gruesome aspect of the secret dungeon's special gailer. The monster was immense, easily twice the height of either of the men, and as broad as an ox. Two complete bearskins had been stitched together, to form the long fur coat it wore. One foot was shed in a leather boot, the other nothing more than a steel-capped peg fixed to the iron rod which had replaced the creature's right leg from the knee down. Yellow tusks jutted from its enormous mouth, a deep scar bisected the side of its broad nose, and a scabby black burn pitted the left side of its face from cheekbone to scalp. In the years serving with the Count of Oslan's army, Strang had seen many ogres, but none were as hideous as Gunder. The ogre stared at the men, nostrils flaring wildly as he snorted down their scent. Strang found himself backing away towards the stairs as the ogre rumbled forwards, but Fulman held his ground, meeting the formidable stare of Gunder. The peg leg of the ogre clapped against the floor as he strode towards the men, the sound stretching away into the unseen limits of the dungeon. Strang could see the mighty muscles rippling beneath the ogre's fur coat, and shuddered as he recalled some of the stories that were told about Gunder in the taverns of Reichland when the hour was late. Gunder had served Judge Volkberg as chief executioner, lopping off heads with such violence that they shot away from their bodies like corks out of a bottle. Ki Gunder growled, deep voice vibrating through the passageway. The ogre extended his enormous hand to Fulman. The witch hunter nodded, placing the ring of keys in the monster's palm. Gunder turned, hobbling across the passage towards one of the cells. Fulman found his eyes locked on the door, the only thing still remaining between him and the thing that haunted his nightmares. The door swung open, and Gunder stepped away, exposing the inky darkness of the cell. Fulman felt his body shudder as he found himself staring into the darkness, visualizing what it contained in his mind's eye. Come along, Strang, he said, still staring into the darkened cell. The witch hunter's words startled his henchman. In their past visits to the Reichsfang, Fulman would always leave the associate in the corridor, while he had gone into the cell alone. Strang wondered at how uneasy Fulman must be to require the mercenary's company to give him the strength to face whatever was in the cell. It was a small room, scarcely ten feet square, with a low, dripping ceiling. The walls were bare, fungus-ridden stone. Scraps of straw and muck littered the uneven floor. An iron cage hung from a chain set into a hook in the ceiling at the center of the room. Strang wrinkled his nose at the stink emanating from the tattered shape inside the box, and even more at a wooden slop bucket resting on the floor beneath the cage, filled to the brim with the inmate's filth. The man in the cage turned his head ever so slightly, blinking milk-white eyes as the light from Fulman's torch 
intruded upon his universe of darkness. A raw pink tongue licked at scabby lips as the prisoner's ragged breath became rapid with excitement. The man's arms were folded awkwardly against his chest, palms turned outward that his fingers were able to grip the bars of the cage. In his agitation, the prisoner tried to move them, succeeding only in a sickly, fluttering motion. The mercenary recognized the brutal residue of the extreme torture and long years of imprisonment. The man's bones had been broken before he had been imprisoned in the cage. The bones had reset, but they had healed in a crooked manner, dictated by the contorted position inside the cage. The prisoner continued blinking at the light, his empty mouth snapping open and closed, a slow, dry croaking wheezed out of his lips. It was with a start that Strang realized that the croaks were actually words. Nephew... The inmate wheezed. Nephew... There was a hate beyond hate in the croaking voice, a limitless malice. As the word rasped across the cell, Strang took a harder look at the crushed, malformed thing inside the cage. Beneath the dirt, beneath the filth and the scabs, beneath the liver-spotted skin and the wrinkled flesh, there was the faintest suggestion of a resemblance, the echo of a face that had, once perhaps, not been very much unlike that of Matthias Fulman. I see you remember me, Erasmus, Fulman said, every word coming as an effort. The thing in the cage began to cough, choking on his sickly laughter. See, see, I see nothing, nephew. Erasmus Glabe twitched one of his broken fingers, trying to point at his milky eyes. Too many years in this tomb you made for me. Only your light, just a yellow glow, that's all. That's all there is, just a yellow glow. Fulman handed a torch to Strang and took a step closer to the cage. You had sight enough to know it was me when I came here, sorcerer. Erasmus Clave's festering laughter hissed again from his wasted frame. In ten years, who else has come here? Only the ogre to feed and water me like a potted plant. The captive closed his blind eyes, tears crawling down his face. Doesn't bring a light with him. No, not that one. Just sniffs his way over here like a great big cat. No light, no warmth, never ever, only dark and cold. Always the dark and the cold. The witch hunter was without pity, as his uncle's mind fell into half-mad babble. Erasmus Clabe couldn't suffer enough to pay for the crimes he committed against humanity and the Empire, the crimes he had committed against his own family. Instead, a deep satisfaction throbbed through Fulman's chest. Maybe it was that same kind of sadistic pleasure that creatures like the late Captain Meiser or Svorza Zerndorf took when they watched a suspect being tortured the perverse enjoyment they experienced that had nothing to do with justice or retribution. If it was, Fulman didn't care, giving himself over to it completely. He knew the feeling was as fragile as a desert flower. As he watched the monster that had destroyed his life weep, he remembered everything his uncle had done. Other faces filled his mind, faces Clive had destroyed. The moment was gone, replaced by the deep sorrow of all that had been lost, all that Clave had taken from him. Fulman's hand closed about his sword, pulling it at a hand's breadth from the scabbard. Clave cocked his head at the sound of steel sliding against leather, an obscene light of hope filling his blind face. Disgust overwhelmed Fulman's rage, and he slammed the blade down. "'I have questions, heretic,' he snarled. "'Questions you will answer.' All that I hear, all that fills my endless night is the dripping water. Clave's voice wheezed from the cage. Drip, drip, splash. Drip, drip, splash. Listen to me, sorcerer. I will not be ignored. Clave's nearly empty mouth spread into a mocking smile. Drip, splash, drip. Drip, drip, drip. 
Philman glared into the heretic's sightless eyes. Does the torch strang? We are done here. Fulman growled, turning his back on the cage. Glaive's body shuddered as he wailed in horror. No, no, for all pity's sake, don't take the light away. Fulman waved his hand, stopping Strang as the mercenary moved to extinguish it against the damp stone floor. Slowly, the witch hunter turned back towards his uncle. You are still sane enough to know fear, Erasmus, aren't you? Maybe coming here wasn't a complete waste of time after all. The relief in Clabe's face faded, and even in his milk-white eyes, a vindictive hate could be seen. The caged sorcerer spat into the shadows, lips curled into a sneer. It has been a long time, nephew. Tell me, is your family well? An inarticulate growl exploded from Fullman's chest, and the witch hunter lunged forwards, gloved hands closing around the bars of the cage. With savage fury, Fullman shook the hanging prison. Clabe cried out in agony as the crushed body was thrown about within the cramped container. I ask the questions, you filth! Fullman roared. The only thing I want to hear from you are answers. Or what? Clabe challenged. What more can you do to me, nephew? Kill me? Fulman leaned forwards, so close he could smell the sickly breath gasping from the sorcerer's lungs. Believe me, Erasmus, I have spent many sleepless nights thinking of things that I could still do to you. Every time I hear a child laugh, every time I hear a face that reminds me of Anya, every time I feel alone and forgotten, I think of you and I think what more can be done to increase your suffering. Do you really want to discover how inventive my imagination has been? As much as he was able within the confines of the cage, Clabe slumped in defeat, all the defiance draining out of him. He shook his head weakly. Then speak your peace, nephew. Fullman stepped away from the cage, wiping his hands on his trouser leg in an effort to remove the filthy grime from his fingers. I need information about your old friends, the ones who used to help you so very much, the ones you helped so very much. The underfolk will gnaw on your bones yet, nephew, Clabe swore. But this time Erasmus Clabe will not be there to stop them. Strange you should be so ungrateful to your uncle for sparing your life. I trust in the protection of Sigmar, not yours, heretic, Thulman spat. I have returned the familial courtesy you showed me beneath the streets of Marienburg. I did not burn you at a stake, Erasmus. You spared my life, I spared yours. You call this life? Clabe moaned. I call it revenge, Fulman retorted, his tone more venomous than an Arabian viper. But you did not answer my question. I am looking for a particular skaven, one of the horned sorcerer priests commanding their verminous breed. The creature stole something, and I will have it back. Clabe's coughing laughter returned, causing the cage to shake once more. Hey, Grey Seer! You are hunting a grey seer. Your bones will line the nest of Skaven pups, and your soul will be a chew toy for the horned rat. I will find this creature, Thulman said, and you will help me. Your dealings with the Underfolk were extensive. There is no man in the Empire who knows more about their pestilential kind. There are thousands upon thousands of the ratkin. Clabe continued laughing. Their tunnels stretch from the waste to the jungles of Araby, from the hills of Estalia to the mists of Cathay. Better to ask me where to find a particular leaf in the forest of Loren. The chance of success would be much higher. Then you cannot help me, Fulman said. I am sorry to have wasted your time, Erasmus. Streng, we are done here. Clabe could sense the yellow glow of the torch withdrawing as Strang moved to the cell door. The sorcerer cried out in panic. 
desperate to keep himself from being plunged back into complete oblivion. Fullman motioned with his hand again, and Strang stepped back into the cell. Yes, Erasmus, you may be thought about something. Maybe I can help you. The sorcerer's words were rapid, fawning, and eager to please the witch hunter's demands. I have had dealings with Gracias. They are not so numerous as the rest of their kind. Perhaps if you describe the creature you are looking for, I might recognize it. The creature I am hunting is an older specimen of its kind, crook back by the weight of its years. Its fur is gray speckled with black, the fur of its hands entirely dark. Two great ram horns grow from the sides of its head. When I saw it, the creature wore black robes and a curious patchwork fur collar. Fullman studied Clive's face as he described the monster, watching for any sign that might betray the sorcerer's thoughts. He saw Clave's eyes narrow as the witch hunter described the fur collar. Something about that detail had touched upon Clave's memories. You know something, Erasmus, Fullman stated. I will hear it. Clave shook his head. Only if you promise me something, promise that you will kill me when you leave here. I will not, Fullman replied. I suffer for your crimes every day I draw breath. So should you. No, Erasmus, I will not kill you. It would sit ill with me to execute the heretic that spared my life. Then promise me you will leave the torch, Clay pleaded. Promise me you will leave the light. Fullman was silent a moment and then slowly nodded his head. I will leave the torch for you, if you can tell me something useful. The ratkin you hunt is a grey seer, Clave said. One that belongs to a particular sect of their kind called the Skritar. Their talisman is that unusual collar you described. It is the custom of the Skritar to rip the fur from the throats of vanquished rivals and stitch their trophies into a garment they wear about their necks. The gracier you saw was one of the Skritar. The warrant that the creature was operating from was destroyed, Fullman told the captive. We captured the warlord of the nest and before it died it claimed that the gracier had escaped to some other lair. Where would it have escaped to? I have your promise about the torch, nephew. Then I shall speak. My dealings with the Skritar were extensive. I came to know them quite well. They are more interested in mankind than most of their kind. They think it might be possible to domesticate us one day. Clave's coughing laughter racked his crumpled body again. For centuries they have maintained a stronghold in the western reaches of the Reichland, a few days' journey from the foot of the Grey Mountains. I visited that lair once. If you were to release me, I am certain I could guide you to this place. The years have not rendered me into an idiot, Erasmus, Fullman snarled. It cost many good men to put you into that cage, and in that cage you will stay until Sigma returns and cleanses the land of all evil. If you can show me how to find a stronghold, you can tell me how to do so. You will need to travel into the southwest corner of the Reichland, Clave said, voice subdued after his desperate gamble for release had been firmly rejected. Find the old silver road that once ran through the province into the dwarf holes of the Grey Mountains. Follow this into the west until the mountain blots out the twilight, and then turn south until you find the township of Wormwater. The stronghold is somewhat near worm water. With diligence and care, you should find it easily enough. If the Skaven don't find you first, that is. The witch hunter was silent again as he considered Clave's directions. The Order of Sigmar maintained one of the best collections of maps outside the Imperial Cartographer's Guild. It should be easy enough to verify the existence of worm water and its situation in Reichland. It was not much to go on, but it was a start. 
and somehow, despite the vile nature of its source, Fullman could not shake the conviction that by following Clave's directions, he would indeed track down both the Grey Seer and Das Buch die Unholden. Maybe even a despicable wretch like Erasmus Clave could be made into an instrument of Sigmar's will. That is enough, Erasmus, Fullman said, turning away from the cage. You have given me a place to start. The witch hunter walked to Streng, relieving him of the torch, and then stepped back to the cage. The warm glow of the torch washed over Clave's face, and it twisted with ecstatic pleasure. Farewell then, nephew, Clave said. Remember me to your family, won't you? Fullman felt the sorcerer's words plunge through him like a knife through his vitals. Pain flooded his face. The witch hunter's voice was a low hiss as he snarled at the cage. Here is your torch, Erasmus. The light vanished as Fullman plunged the brand into the overflowing slop bucket beneath the sorcerer's cage. The witch hunter turned and stalked through the darkness out of the cell. Behind him, Clabe shrieked his despair and outrage. Liar! Liar! Clabe cried. Kill me, Matthias! Kill me, you spineless, cringing cur! Your wife was a harlot, and your child was an idiot brat! The best thing for them was to die! Kill me, you bastard! Kill me! The cell door swung shut behind Fullman, drowning out the obscene cries of the sorcerer. Strang stood beside the witch hunter, watching as he tried to force back the pain tearing through his body. At last, Fullman seemed to regain some of his composure, enough to accept the ring of keys back from the hulking Gunder. Come on, Strang, Fullman growled, marching off towards the stairway. We have work to do. Strang lingered behind, watching as the witch hunter mounted the stone steps and disappeared beyond the first spiral of the stairwell. The mercenary dug into his pouch belt and removed a few coins he had yet to squander on cheap drink and tavern doxies. He turned towards the ogre, placing the coins in Gunder's calloused grip. That thing in there, Strang said, pointing his thumb at Clave's cell door. Has a few too many teeth. I'd appreciate it if you did something about that. 